So it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Varun Bhale Rao. So Varu Varun is uh, uh, one of the uh, rising stars in this field of, uh, 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 I think, transients uh, in, in general. And again, Varun's research interests are so broad, it's actually difficult to uh, uh, classify him under specific uh, fields, uh, but I'll try. So Varun uh, did his uh, B.Tech in Electrical Engineering and his uh, uh, PhD in Caltech from Sri Kulkarni, and uh, who is one of the doyens of astronomy, and uh, Fiona Harrison. I think he worked on a new star, uh, and one of the key players in New Star lit, did lots of interesting things on gamma ray bursts and other other kinds of transients. Then he got, uh, after finishing his PhD at Caltech, he got the prestigious, I think, Vaidya Rai Chaudhary Fellowship at Ayuka, which is which only goes to the cream de la cream, and uh, where he worked uh, on uh, astrosat satellite and on uh, electromagnetic uh, follow-ups of. Uh, uh, LIGO triggers, as well as a whole bunch of other uh, uh, other it, it transients throughout the electromagnetic spectrum, and he, he had uh, uh, DST inspired fellowship. He's also got the Vainu Bappu medal, which is given to like the uh, I, basically people who are who are going to become basically superstars in this field. And you can look at the other awardees of uh, uh, Vainu Bapu medalists uh, just to get an idea. He's also got uh, NASA team medals and a whole bunch of other pri prizes, which I don't uh, recollect at the moment. And uh, after his postdoc at Ayuka, he had a faculty, uh, he had multiple faculty offers at all the, I think, the plump places. And ID Bombay was lucky to have him. And he's uh, set up uh, and, and one of the best uh, sort of internationally recognized group on a follow-up of electromagnetic transients and all the best students at ID Bombay and other places also gravitate towards him. And you, whenever we have overlapped in conferences, after every talk, there's a whole sort of conglom agglomeration of students who sort of hover around him asking if, I, if they can join his group. Okay, And I'm sure there'll be many more requests after this talk. So without further ado, so Varun, go ahead. And I look forward to what he has to say. Okay, And thank you for giving this talk. So. Thank you. Thank you. Jim. Go ahead. Very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I've, uh, we've been talking about this for a while and uh, I kept meaning to come to IIT Hyderabad, but uh, at least fortunately now, uh, thanks to everyone getting comfortable with online seminars, this is happening. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, gravitational waves, but with a twist. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, how it relates to more conventional astronomy, so observational astronomy as, well, as such. Uh, this photo here, by the way, has nothing to do with the talk directly, uh, but it is a beautiful photo taken by the observing assistant at um, Hanle. So this, of course, uh, is Comet Neowise, and uh, uh, near the center here, uh, can you see my mouse, mouse pointer? Uh. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. So near the center here, you see uh, the dome of the two meter telescope and to the right is the dome of the 0.7 meter Growth India telescope, which is a telescope that was uh, a lot of the automation was done by students, uh, students from ISAR Pune and then from IIT Bombay. Uh, and this is India's first uh, fully robotic uh, optical telescope. So, and it uh, works in this area of, uh, you know, studying electromagnetic radiation from gravitational wave sources. So this title has quite a mouthful, high energy emissions, gravitational waves, there's a name of a satellite. So I'm going to break it down and go step by step. So we'll start with uh, talking just about gravitational waves. Uh, there's a lot of students here in the audience, so we'll make sure that everyone is on the same page with that. And then I will talk about what do we mean by EMGW, which stands for electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational wave sources. So what have we seen so far? What did we understand? And then uh, apart from the physics that we learned about this object, we will then look at the lessons learned saying, what can we do better? How can we make sure that the next time we have such an opportunity, uh, we actually can get good benefits from it. And finally, I will introduce Daksha, which is the mission that we have proposed, a completely Indian mission to um, make a huge, huge impact, order of magnitude better 
sensitivity than any existing means in order to detect these kind of transmits. So let's start with uh, gravitational waves. And uh, instead of trying to come up with my own way of explaining it, I have simply borrowed this from PhD comics. So you have probably all seen some kind of a representation like this, where uh, space-time is often shown as a 2D fabric because we are drawing on 2D surfaces. And then if an object is placed in that, then the object actually distorts space-time around it. If you now plop a planet right next to it, then uh, or any second object, then that object is going to orbit the first one because of the gravity, which itself can be interpreted as a distortion in space-time. And that is because space-time is curved, the path of the object is curved too. Notice that this object also has actually distorted the gravity, uh, um, distorted the space-time around it. It has created its own little impact in the gravitational field. So uh, as a result of this, if I now have two objects that are present somewhere in space, maybe a black hole and a neutron star, or something like that, if they're orbiting around each other, they're both distorting space-time around themselves in the vicinity. And as they move, that distortion also moves. And this movement propagates as ripples through space-time, which is uh, what we see as gravitational waves. And these waves are then detected by these massive detectors called LIGO and Virgo and Kagra. So this is uh, LIGO Hanford is the fly past. There's another LIGO detector in Livingston. Uh, we are going to get one in India. There's a detector called Virgo in Italy, and the Japanese are building one called Kadra. So with these detectors, uh, we have seen a lot of different kind of sources here, actually. Let me mute this. So what is shown here is a bunch of merging gravitational uh, wave detections, a bunch of merging black holes that were detected in the second observing run and first observing run of LIGO. This was the first source ever detected. Note that this is two black holes being represented here and time has been slowed down. So a lot of these discoveries have been made so far. And they, uh, the first one uh, made a lot of headlines, got the Nobel Prize. The second one, people clapped. And by the time we are at discovery number 50, people have stopped caring already. So, that tells you how quickly people can get used to extremely mind-blowing uh, results. Einstein himself um, predicted this more than 100 years ago, and he was of the opinion that these would never, ever be discovered. So uh, extremely fantastic achievement of technology and science uh, together is what enables these detections. But I said that uh, this is the sources which have been, these are the sources which have been discovered in gravitational waves, but they are not the only type of sources. There are a lot of different objects that can emit gravitational waves. So you can have something which is called continuous wave sources. Uh, for example, if you have neutron stars, which are asymmetric, and if they are, um, if, as they're spinning rapidly, they can emit gravitational waves. In fact, the paper about this just came out on the archive from the uh, LIGO scientific collaboration. You could also have things called burst sources. So if you have a supernova explosion, so a star which is say 10 or more times heavier than the sun, eight or more times heavier than the sun, at the end of its life blows up as a supernova. And at its core, it will leave behind a neutron star or a black hole. And this core collapse process itself lasts for only a few milliseconds. So the star which lived for 10 or 100 million years is going to, the core collapse itself is going to happen within milliseconds. And even if there is slight asymmetry there, asymmetric mass motion generates gravitational waves. Okay, stochastic is uh, so, uh, some total of all the sources you can't look at. And of course, the very interesting part for me is the unknown sources, which is, um, this bunch here, uh, every time we have opened a new window at the universe, we have discovered sources which nobody had ever imagined. When radio astronomy was born, pulsars and neutron stars were discovered. X-ray astronomy, we had never thought of things like AGN and blazars and so on, which were all discovered there. Now we have this completely new window and we might find something very interesting here as well. Now the sources which have been discovered to date fall in this class of merging binary. So they could be either mergers of two black holes or a black hole and a neutron star, or they could be mergers of two neutron stars. And for the rest of this talk, I'm mainly going to focus on this final category, which is the merger of two neutron stars. 
Now, uh, the gravitational wave part of it has to do with the physics of gravity. So it is related to the masses of the object. It is going to talk, uh, tell us about the spins of the object because black holes with very high spin can actually change the signature that we see in the gravitational wave waveform. But broadly speaking, it is going to tell us about the geometric properties of the source. So where was the source placed? How far was it? How inclined was the orbit? Was it face on or edge on and so on? Electromagnetic radiation, on the other hand, has to do with emissions from the surface, typically. So it is going to tell us more about surface phenomena, loosely speaking. Of course, with telescopes, we can pinpoint where the source is, so it gives us extremely precise location. Uh, the spectra tell us what kind of nuclear synthesis happened, what kind of elements were produced in this merger, what was the property of the ejecta, were there jets, was there beaming, how much mass was thrown out, how fast was it moving, and all of this even has implications for cosmology. But it is only if we can put this side and this side together that we get a complete astrophysical picture of what actually happened at the source. And this is why the electromagnetic follow-up is extremely important for uh, understanding the gravitational wave sources completely. Now, um, I'm an astrophysicist, so let's talk about what keeps me up. Just and one uh, slight interjection. So I, I guess if anyone has any, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, anyone has any question, please raise your hands up in the Zoom chat. Okay, and then I will monitor. And Varun, you, will you take questions during the talk or you prefer at the end? Um, during the talk is also fine. If it is okay, something fine. that would have a large discussion, we could uh, defer it to that. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, sorry, I should have mentioned being. Okay, go ahead. So um, let's look at the astrophysics part of it, right? What keeps me up at night? Um, I'm an astronomer. Anything keeps me up at night. So maybe the question is what keeps me up during daytime. So there are two main questions that my current research is um, focused around. First is where are all the heavy metals in the universe formed? And the second is, what is the equation of state of ultra-dense matter? So uh, let's look at this. Uh, for example, this is a color-coded version of the periodic table. And uh, in astronomy counting, we are extremely lazy. So we have hydrogen and helium, of course, and everything beyond that is called a metal. So in astronomy parlance, uh, carbon is a metal, oxygen is a metal. And you can see that uh, all the carbon and nitrogen that are present in our body were largely made from supernova explosions of massive stars or dying low mass stars, which slowly shed off their outer layers. Uh, the oxygen that we breathe all formed in supernova explosions, sodium, magnesium, and so on as well. But when you come to the bottom of the periodic table here with uh, exotic and kind of important metals, you know, silver, gold, platinum, all of these are coded purple, which means that we believe that they were formed in merging neutron stars. And we need to understand this. This uh, Is this exactly, uh, is this the only site where this R process nucleosynthesis can happen? Is this the dominant site? How often do these mergers happen? How do they then spread these metals through the universe? Okay, and the other part of course is the equation of state, which is nothing but a relation between the pressure and density and temperature of matter. And we want to understand the equation of state not in uh, ordinary conditions around us, but the equation of state of ultra dense matter where the densities are higher than atomic nuclei. And these questions now, both of these are very, very hard to answer in laboratories, but nature does provide us with excellent free laboratories for this. Okay, so here is uh, one such example. This is an artist's impression, uh, but physics-wise quite accurate of a merger of two neutron stars. The blue lines that you see here are gravitational waves. Of course, they won't look blue. They're just rendered that way. The two neutron stars spiral in, merge. There's a massive explosion. It launches two jets perpendicular to the orbit. There's a bunch of ejecta around the core. The jets then go and interact with the interstellar medium and they can form a shock there. So there's a lot that is happening here. Let's try to understand it again. So we'll look at this. So first, the two neutron stars started in a wide orbit as they uh, spiraled together because they were emitting gravitational waves and losing energy. So now these two finally collided. At the moment of collision, matter can be ejected and the remnant at the center could be a short-lived uh, neutron star or a magnetar or it could directly be a black hole. We don't fully know yet. And then this material and this material here, which is now outside that black hole, 
can emit a lot of light and it actually did emit this across all wavelengths this particular thing was an event called gw170817 that stands for gravitational wave event on the 17th of august 2017 so the first discovery for example was gw150914 which means 14th of september 2015 so gw170817 was uh, this discovery uh, at the bottom you see time in seconds on the x axis and on the y axis we have um, the frequency in hertz the ground based gravitational wave detectors work in the frequency range of say 10 or 20 hertz at the lower end to few kilohertz and as the object in spiral its frequency increased as a function of time if uh, this happens to be audio frequency so you can actually take this signal and play it if you want um, important thing to point out for the students here is that this is not sound you can convert it to sound just as when i am speaking here my uh, image and my sound are both getting converted into electromagnetic radiation uh, which is going from my laptop over the wifi Uh, to you people, and then it is being converted back into sound. The waves that traveled in between were not sound waves. So this, if you converted it into sound and played it, it would sound whoop. And uh, this was detected by LIGO and Virgo. And uh, just about 1.3 seconds after that, a burst of gamma rays was detected by two satellites. So the top two panels here are the light curves. So number of counts as a function of time. how many photons they were detecting in two different bands this is in the x ray band 10 to 50 kv and in the hard x ray band 50 to 300 kv whereas this is from another satellite called integral and you can see that there's a clear burst seen in all three bands okay and i remember sending a message immediately to my students this is a big deal we need to understand what is going on here let's actually take our telescopes and start analyzing this so um this actually led to a huge observing frenzy so any red spot that you see here is when a telescope is observing that green spots are for radio telescopes red spots are for optical telescopes and this is as a function of time since the event so we are now at 3 days after the event you can see that telescopes were used from all the continents including antarctica there were observations taken from there and uh, radio telescopes you can also notice are happily observing during daytime but uh, this object was quite close to the sun just about 30 or so degrees from the sun so optical telescopes observe immediately as it gets dark because the object then sets after that and the overall follow up that was done here when we finally published a joint paper interpreting this that paper had 3500 authors uh from about a thousand different institutes who had worked together in order to obtain all of this data so here is the uh, uh, set of discovery images these are taken by various optical telescopes you see a uh, elliptical galaxy here and this source which is marked out by the blue ticks is actually the detection of a new source which was not seen there a few days before okay and eventually people went and found data which was just about uh, the day before this gw event so remember the uh, detectors in ligo uh, detected gravitational waves space based observatories detected x rays and gamma rays from the source and then optical telescopes started searching that part of the sky and then they found this point source also in astronomy we are used to thinking of pretty pictures but look at this image by eye you cannot say that there is a source here but if you do good image processing which is what we do in all of these cases then you can actually figure out that there is a new point source over here which is uh, in addition to the typical galaxy image that has been seen okay and the first images actually came about 11 or so hours after uh, the uh, after the discovery of the event so here are the pretty pictures i talked about this is a hubble space telescope image of the same galaxy you can see these stars as reference 1 2 and 3 and those are seen here as well 1 2 and 3 and then here are images showing the object in uv light in infrared light and in radio wavelengths so we observed it across the entire electromagnetic spectrum here is uh, data from jmrt um, our own radio telescope uh, this is seen uh, first imaged about 12 days after the explosion and the source 
should have been here. Uh, let me change the laser color. You can't see this. Okay, so the source should have been seen here, but it wasn't. And then we went back a couple of months after the event, and here we actually see faint emission from the source. As you go to higher frequencies with VLA and ATCA, the source becomes more clear. Uh, this is not. This has nothing to do with the quality of the telescope. This has to do with the physics of radio uh, interferometry itself as to why you get higher resolution images here. And then we uh, observed it as a function of time. The source actually became brighter. And you can see the x-axis here is going up to 100 days after the discovery. And the source kept getting brighter, but very nicely described by a simple power law in both frequency and time. So we kept following the source. Uh, we studied it in great detail. Here is the uh, light curve optical and so UVOIR stands for ultraviolet optical and infrared observations. In UV bands with swift observations, it faded extremely quickly. It was gone within a couple of days. In optical, it faded at moderate speeds. And then in infrared, it actually we could see the rise and then it decayed off very, very slowly. And so K band is around two microns wavelength. So um, not just optical photometry, we also did spectroscopy. So this is spectra taken at different intervals after the image. And you can see that uh, this is bright in optical first and faint in um, IR. You can also see that roughly speaking, this is a black body. This kind of looks like a Planck curve, but there are some absorption features here. Some of this are, uh, these absorptions are from the source, some are from the Earth's atmosphere. The spectra shown here have not been calibrated for that. And you can see that uh, very quickly over time, so in just a matter of, this was at 1.5 days, this was at 2.6 days, and you can see how much the source has faded. You also start seeing more prominent absorption features in the spectrum. The peak temperature was uh, here and it has now decayed to longer wavelengths. So the source is cooling as a function of time. And then it is just fading across all wavelengths. And within a matter of about a week, you can see that the intensity is far, far lower than what it was when the first spectra of the source were taken. So putting all of this together, uh, we actually get a very nice, consistent, simple physics-based model. So what is plotted here is the flux density in units called microjanskis. Let's not worry about the units. This is as a function of frequency starting from radio here, going all the way to x-rays here. Okay, So this is um, at around uh, a gigahertz frequency here, 10 raised to 9. And then this is optical around few times 10 raised to 14. And this is x-ray 10 raised to 18. So this is order of a keV energy. And uh, you can see that at all epochs, starting from 15 days after the explosion to a full year after the explosion, the entire thing is fit by a single straight power law. This is a beautiful demonstration of synchrotron radiation, a simple slope measured all across. There is, uh, you can calculate the P uh, factor, which is the power law slope of the electron population distribution and very, very nice uh, validation of what we had expected from this source theoretically. And here again is the last uh, slide about this source. This is how the uh, light curve was as a function of time. So you can see that in radio, optical, and x-ray, the source actually became brighter, uh, peaked between 100 to 200 days after the explosion, and went down. Uh, here I'm referring to a particular component of emission. There was also another component called the kilonova, in which optical was bright first, faded, and then rose again. So putting all of this together, what did we really learn from the source? So uh, we learned a lot. Here's a simple way of checking. In astronomy, we use a single uh, central data repository called ADS. And I did this search on ADS today um, for this object, GW170817. It has been 1,078 days since the discovery of the event. And there are currently 1,164 papers about this. Um, and this, by the way, this slope also has been surprisingly constant. We have been adding about one paper a day for a few years now. It's been almost three years since the discovery. So let me try to get back to the two key points that I said. Um, 
So what is plotted here is the R process abundance as a function of atomic mass number. Okay, so as a function of the atomic mass on the x-axis, how much of some element do you expect to be produced by this R process nucleosynthesis? And uh, it turns out that if you have this extremely neutron-rich environment, which is what you would get if two neutron stars collide, then uh, there are three particular peaks that are seen in this R process nucleosynthesis. They are marked here as the first, second, and third peak. Also marked as the lanthanide region here. And this is what we had uh, theoretically predicted. This broadly matches with the actual measured distributions as well. And uh, what we did was we looked at all of these spectra and they seem to be rather featureless here. There are these tiny wiggles that you can see. But these wiggles actually mean a lot if you are an astronomer. And with these, we can actually figure out what the absorption is coming from. Actually, IR spectra I have not shown here. You also see these broad absorption uh, dips in uh, the infrared spectra. What we also did was that few months later, we went back and imaged the source with uh, the Spitzer infrared space telescope. And all of that showed us exactly what you would expect from R process nucleosynthetic decay. So, <coughs> excuse me. So what you would get is that uh, each element has its own characteristic absorption line. We are all familiar with the Balmer series, for example. Here, because there, was, uh, there are a lot of electrons with energy levels quite close to each other, you actually get a blend of hundreds of lines. And that blend where you would expect it for R process elements, we saw it there. And also these elements which are formed, a lot of them are radioactive. So you expect them to decay at a certain rate. And that tells you how fast the light curve should fade. And that is also what we saw exactly as predicted. The second thing was the equation of state. So equation of state, roughly speaking, is either called soft or stiff or hard. So if you think of it this way, suppose you're holding a ball of matter, you increase the pressure. Okay, And after you increase the pressure, if the density changes a lot, it means that it got squished. So that's called a soft equation of state. And if the density does not change much, it means that it, the object is stiff or hard. So that's called a stiff equation of state. Now, uh, based on other uh, observations to date with conventional telescopes, we have seen that neutron stars uh, definitely can be uh, about two solar masses in weight at least, or they could be heavier than that. And um, that means that the equation of state cannot be too soft because it cannot support so much matter. It would just collapse into a black hole. Now, based on this LIGO observations, uh, what was uh, proven was that the equation of state is not very hard either. So these are uh, some parameters called lambda 1, lambda 2. And in this diagram, uh, if the equation of state was here, it would have been called a hard equation of state. Here, it would have been soft. And this green shaded region that you see is the region that was inferred from the LIGO observation. So LIGO observations tell us that the equation of state is not too hard either. And other uh, radio observations of pulsars before have told us that it's not too soft. So all of these constraints are from this single observation. Okay, We found one object, one merger of two neutron stars, and it told us that uh, there are a bunch of results I have not talked about. This was the first direct evidence that uh, gamma ray bursts are caused by mergers of neutron stars. That had been a hypothesis for a long, long time, many decades. That was verified. It gave us an independent verification of the Hubble's constant. Uh, it gave inputs in cosmology, uh, theory of jets, and the works. Okay, so, um, but uh, what is now shown here is in the first part of the third LIGO observing run. Uh, so this event was discovered in what was called O2, the second observing run of LIGO. And later LIGO uh, was shut down for upgrades. We started O3. O3 was ended a month or so before the schedule uh, due to COVID-19. And right now LIGO will be doing a series of upgrades again when the observatory staff can uh, safely start coming back to the site. But in O3A, so until about September 2019, here is a whole set of uh, candidates that was discovered by the LIGO and Virgo collaborations. They are numbered by dates here. And what is shown on these different marks is what we think the object was. So some of these were thought to be most likely terrestrial. 
some which have been cut out were withdrawn saying that no this was probably a noise glitch you see that a lot of these events are actually black holes but there are a bunch of these events here which were candidates for binary neutron star mergers now this one here uh, actually has been confirmed and published since this is uh, 190425z uh there is another object that we followed up so a lot of neutron star candidates is the take home message here okay but um here's a table listing out all, uh, the most promising uh, candidates for binary neutron stars and uh, you can see that for all of them this last column here is important no counterpart was detected the only counterpart that was detected so far for binary neutron star mergers comes from this GW seventeen zero eight one seven, which happened in O two, and if you think about it, actually this column is going to give us the answer for that. Actually, a combination of both of these columns. Okay, so first, this was at a distance of forty one mega parsecs. Okay, a parsec is about three point two six light years. So this is about uh, you, know, you do the multiplication. But what is important here is that all of these events. were at least a factor of 4 to 8 times further away now if a source is 4 times further away then it means that the intensity of light from it is going to be 16 times weaker okay and that made it so much harder to detect the second thing is that these sources because we got lucky with this one and this was very nearby it was very nicely localized to about 31 square degrees for comparison the full moon is about half a degree across so a box that would just contain the full moon would be about uh, 0.25 square degrees a typical telescope for example i showed you a image of the uh, himalayan chandra telescope and the growth india telescope the himalayan chandra telescope has a field of view of about a quarter degree so again when you squared that we are talking about uh, roughly 0.1 square degrees or so field of view whereas if you look at this first event here the localization area on the sky was 7000 square degrees so we would have if we were limited to just normal uh, deep observation telescopes we would have to take 70000 images to find that object fortunately not all telescope field of views are so small for example growth india telescope uh, field of view is about uh, half a square degree and then some partners that we work with for example the zwicky transient facility has a field of view of 40 square degree so uh, but these searches are still hard and the objects that we were looking for were much fainter so here is another table now uh, which is telling you how faint or bright would you expect the source to be so uh, a lot happening here so let's focus on two particular columns first is that in optical these objects uh, uh, 170817 was uh, about 17th magnitude when it was discovered Uh, whereas the predicted magnitudes for these other objects are about 20 or 21 typical optical surveys reach about 21st magnitude sensitivity some specialized instruments can go deeper so these were uh, just lying around the limits of sensitivity except for this one but this one was a very wide field of uh, object okay uh, infrared uh, this was about 18th magnitude but wide field infrared instruments can go only till about 17th now uh, those of you who don't have a astro background magnitude is a logarithmic scale just as you have uh, decibels which is a logarithmic scale for sound uh, except that magnitudes is a negative logarithmic scale so the brightest star that you see in the sky which is sirius is about minus 1.5 if you are in a nice dark location then the faintest star you can see by eye is sixth magnitude and a difference of five magnitudes is about a factor of 100 so in ir gatini can uh, do wide field imaging with a sensitivity of 17.5 these objects 22 to 23 uh, is about five magnitudes fainter so they are about 100 times fainter than the sensitivity of and then lastly we come to the x ray uh, or gamma ray energy column and here you see that these are all few times 10 raised to minus 8 or lower whereas typical x ray gamma ray instruments have a sensitivity that is about an order of magnitude worse so that's again a problem and that is something which we need to fix okay so going forward what is next what have we learned from what we have seen so far so let's focus on three key lessons okay 
Um, so I've told you uh, about AstroSat. We didn't talk a lot, but um, AstroSat is this fully Indian satellite which was launched in 2015. Uh, I have been working a lot with AstroSat uh, from before launch. Uh, I'm part of the team for an instrument called CZTI. And CZTI has detected over 300 gamma ray bursts uh, to date in the last four to five years. But this particular source was missed. Okay, so we took the known properties of this from the integral and the Fermi observations and we calculated whether AstroSat should have seen it and we should have had an extremely clear detection, about 10 sigma or so based on our calculation. But we missed it. So what happened? So what is plotted here is an uh, uh, all-sky map and um, you can focus on this uh, small green oval here. That is where uh, the source was finally localized by LIGO and Virgo. And then roughly where my laser pointer is sitting right now was the final uh, exact position of this source. Okay, But this gray circle here marks the area that was hidden behind Earth as seen by AstroSat. So we missed this source by about 300 seconds. So here we have an extremely sensitive detector. If this is Earth, AstroSat was here and the explosion happened here. So AstroSat couldn't see it. The source became visible in just 300 seconds. That's how close we were. So what does this tell us? Well, lesson number one is that you can't afford to blink. You have to look at the entire sky at all times. The next thing was that the signal was very, very faint. Okay, In particular, look at this thing, which I have. So this plot we have seen before, but look at this little blip. Okay, Suppose you did not have the top two panels, and if we had shown you only this, would you really trust the signal? Okay, and in fact, this very paper from which this figure is taken says that if the source was only 30% fainter, it would have been completely missed. So our current network of uh, space-based detectors is not really sensitive enough to be able to detect these events. Uh, in fact, if you look at this as a gamma ray burst, which I said AstroSat has seen over 300 such bursts to date, what is plotted here, you can ignore the x-axis, but along the y-axis, is the typical energy that is released in such a burst, assuming isotropic emission. And you can see, uh, I don't know if you can read the numbers, but this here is 10 raised to 51 ergs, and this here is 10 raised to 55. And this star over here, which is at a few times 10 raised to 46, is the uh, total energy emitted by 170817. So this was very, very faint. It was three to four orders of magnitude uh, fainter than typical short GRBs. And not just that, as I said, the next sources were a factor of few further away, which means that the so, um, emission that reached us was an order of magnitude fainter. The other thing was that this was broadband. It was seen from few KV to hundreds of KV, but it was missed by some of these highly successful gamma ray burst detectors, the most famous of which is probably SWIFT, AstroSat we already talked about, CALIT, and so on. So what we learn from this is that uh, we need an order of magnitude more sensitivity as compared to current missions if we want to be detecting these kind of sources. So and can I ask a quick question? Yes. Uh, so why was it missed? Would, it, would SWIFT have seen it or was there some uh, technical reason because of which Earth SWIFT missed it? Earth occultation. Same reason as why AstroSat missed it. AstroSat and SWIFT both happened to be on the wrong side of Earth when the event happened. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. So these two uh, are the current record holders in terms of discovering and studying such explosions in space, gamma ray bursts. Fermi is a NASA plus ESA mission. SWIFT is a NASA mission. Um, SWIFT is about 15 years old. Fermi is about 10 or so. And they have been going really strong. And they have revolutionized this field. But I'm saying now we need something which is an order of magnitude better than these. And the last thing is, okay, you saw something, so what? Okay, so here's a uh, paragraph copied from the paper. Of course, I don't expect you to read the full thing, but let me highlight some parts. Okay, this says poorly constrained power law index. The E peak is 230 plus or minus 80 keV, and alpha, which is a power law slope of the spectrum, is 0.8 plus minus 1.4. You can see the huge error bars here. Um, then it says tail emission appears spectrally soft because they can't constrain it completely. Uh, and then it says uh, the emission is too weak and near the lower energy detection bound of GBM to rule out a non-thermal spectrum. 
So the lesson from this is we need a wide spectral band. We don't want to be left doing these guesses. We want to see the entire spectrum so that we can see what are the different components that are contributing to the spectrum. So putting this all together, we need, uh, if we are building a next generation mission, we want something that has an order of magnitude higher sensitivity, which means you build a larger detector with lower intrinsic noise and with better background rejection. You want a wide spectral band uh, going maybe from uh, soft X-rays all the way to gamma rays, so one keV to more than an MeV, so that you can see the full spectrum, not just parts of it, and then continuous all sky coverage. So you need to put two satellites on opposite sides of Earth. And with these ideas in mind, we went ahead and proposed this mission called Daksha. Uh, Daksha is a fully Indian mission. We proposed it to ISRO just about two years ago. Uh, the idea is to build two satellites. Uh, which will use three types of detectors. So there will be soft X-ray detectors uh, that will cover 1 to 25 keV. These will be silicon drift detectors. Uh, then we will have medium energy uh, cadmium zinc telluride detectors. By the way, these SDDs are, uh, uh, all of these are space tested uh, detectors. SDDs are currently giving great results in the Chandrayaan orbiter. Uh, Chandrayaan 2 orbiter, the medium energy detectors are the same ones that they've used in um, uh, AstroSat, but they are also used on RT2 in Aditya and so on. And then at the core of it, high energy photons will pass through this top layer. And at the core, we will have this thing called uh, uh, sodium iodide scintillators, which will give us energy coverage uh, starting from about 100 keV going above 1 MeV. And then there will be two satellites on opposite sides of Earth. All of this put together, what do we get? The advantage is that the two satellite effective area is about 1700 square centimeters, which is uh, averaged over the entire sky, which is about a factor of six better than Fermi, for instance. And remember that uh, we also have lower background because of the detector technology that we are using. So overall we get roughly an order of magnitude sensitivity. Sky coverage, uh, we get about 100%, uh, both satellites put together. And then the energy range that we cover is also wider than both SwiftBat and Fermi GPL. So with all of this power put together, what can we get? Well, uh, I told you that so far exactly one event has been detected. If we take all the properties of that and we did extensive simulations based on this, based on our best understanding of LIGO data and taking theoretical models fully consistent with this, and with Daksha, we expect to detect dozens of these mergers per year. And we will also detect about a thousand gamma ray bursts per year. And this number is very uncertain because nobody knows how many faint gamma ray bursts exist in the universe. So um, for comparison, for me, detected close to 3000 bursts uh, after, after 10 years. Okay, So it took 10 years for, for me to reach that milestone. We can localize these to about 5 to 10 degrees on the sky. We will get broadband prompt spectra. This is the only mission that is actually going to be capable of getting soft X-ray spectra of gamma ray bursts. And then we will also be able to measure polarization of hard X-rays, something that is quite tricky and is very important in order to figure out what exactly the jet is doing. Because if you see polarization, it implies that there is some kind of a coherent emission process. The other thing that we will do is actually very interesting. Uh, we will be able to tell LIGO exactly when and where a burst happened. Now, when you are searching for a signal, there is something called a trials factor. If you are willing to be able, uh, if you are willing to accept a signal coming from any source at any point of time, then you are very susceptible to noise. But if I narrow down your search space, saying instead of searching for a full day of data, search in only this uh, one minute window, Okay, that gives you a factor of 1,000 um, in, in your trials factor. Or if I tell you where a source was in the sky, then it tells you what should be the relative time delay between the gravitational wave signal detection and different detectors. So with all of this, you can drastically lower the false alarm rate for gravitational wave sources, which means you can lower the SNR requirement, broadly speaking, and this itself, uh, we have calculated should be able to increase the LIGO sensitivity by a factor of two to three for binary neutron star missions. Think of this. It is quite amazing. We are not only taking electromagnetic observations to learn more about the source, we are 
telling LIGO, hey, look here and look more carefully here and see if you found something. LIGO, of course, cannot repoint their antennas. They're observing the entire sky at all times. But we can do more specialized data analysis there, and that will increase the rate of detection. And finally, we are launching something that is um, an order of magnitude more sensitive, and that opens up a huge discovery space. We will definitely start seeing all kind of uh, other weird transients. Some of them that we uh, were expecting but hadn't seen so far, and hopefully several which nobody had even thought of, because that's where all the fun of discovering comes. Um, what are the other future missions? Well, uh, there's a bunch of CubeSat concepts like BurstCube, which is a NASA uh, project. There's a project called Hermes from Italy. These are all about 20 times smaller than what we've proposed, um, more than 20 times smaller, actually. A few lobster eye concepts, none of which are fully funded. Uh, the only serious competition is this instrument called GECAM, which is a Chinese mission that will be launched in November or December this year. Uh, unfortunately for them, because of uh, change in LIGO's plans, during their first year, LIGO won't be observing, but our sensitivity is about a factor of three better than their projected sensitivities. And then there is a concept, uh, again, a NASA mission that is currently under consideration uh, or under pro early proposal phases. They are uh, trying to see if they could make something like this for around 2030. Daksha, on the other end, we want to launch on a pretty fast time scale. Uh, our original proposed time frame was about three years from now. So building Daksha, uh, it, the project is led by IIT Bombay, but we are working jointly with PRL, Ahmedabad, TIFR in Mumbai, Ayuka, Pune, and Arara and ISRO in Bangalore. Uh, and there are several active sub-teams. We are working on uh, developing the science cases, detectors and electronics, uh, design and fabrication, analyzing the thermal components, making sure the detectors can uh, stay at a good operating temperature. Now, ISRO, um, early, uh, about two years ago, had called for proposals for astrophysics missions. And this was one of about 18 or 19 proposals submitted. And we've been shortlisted as a promising proposal. And we've been given some seed funding to develop a proof of concept. So that's what we are working on right now. And once we have a proof of concept, that is when ISRO will actually evaluate us to see if the full mission should be approved or not. So I'll leave you with that and uh, we can take any questions.